It's a great privilege to introduce our guest today. He's the founder and lead pastor of Quest Church in Seattle, a multi-ethnic and multi-generational church. He's the founder and executive director of One Day's Wages, a nonprofit organization that challenges people to give one day's of their wage to fight poverty. He's also the author of the book, Overrated, and is one of the keynote speakers later this afternoon at our Women in Leadership Conference that is happening on the other side of campus. Let's welcome Pastor Eugene Cho. Thank you. Well, thank you for being with us. Yeah, it's a joy to, a joy to be here this morning. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for being here. Well, Eugene, you know, you, your children have some great names. We, 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 I met one of them today. Yes. Your children have some great names. Can you tell us a little bit about, about your family yeah. and how picking the names of your children, tell us a little bit about your calling as a pastor and an activist. Yes. Uh, so my wife and I, we've been married for 20 years. Next week, we're heading off somewhere to celebrate our 20th anniversary. Wow. And uh, we have three children. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have three children, and their names are both have biblical references and pop culture references. Okay. And the reason why we did that is because scripture matters to our family, but we also care about culture. Yeah. And we want uh, our family to engage the culture with the gospel of Christ. So for example... Our oldest daughter, her name is Jubilee. Yeah. Uh, from Leviticus, Old Testament, God forgives all debt every 50 years. X-Men character for anyone that's an X-Men, <laughs> no one here. Uh, also, our second child, her name is Trinity. Yeah. Uh, obviously, a theological truth from the film Matrix. And then lastly, our son's name is Jedi. Uh, Jedi from Star Wars. We're a huge Star Wars family fan. Yeah. And uh, it's Solomon's Hebrew name, Jedediah. Absolutely. So, yeah, and so we, we just really care about taking the truth of the gospel, right. living it, embodying it, and then in hopes of um, engaging our larger culture with it. Great, yeah. great. You know, uh, the, the subtitle for your book is something like, you know, Christians are, or we're a generation of Christians that like the idea of changing the world yeah. rather than actually changing the world. Yeah. Can you unpack that for us sure. a little bit? Yeah, so the, the actual tagline is, are we more in love with the idea of changing the world than actually changing the world? And it's really more of a confession. Mm. You know, it's, uh, the book is my confession to others, including my church, yeah. that I, and I don't think I'm alone. I think we live in a culture today where we want to do good things. Absolutely. We want to be activists. We want to incite change. And that's to be celebrated Absolutely. I think all these statistics that we hear from numerous sources only corroborate that, that a lot of young people, a lot of millennials want to change the world. Yeah. But I think there's a kind of a, a false pretense mm. that it's ridiculous if we want to change the world, A, without acknowledging that we need to change ourselves. Mm. Oftentimes we ask God to move mountains, but maybe we neglect the possibility that maybe we're the mountain that God wants to move. Whoa, whoa. So I think there's something there that we need to be challenged by. And then secondly, I think it is easier in a culture of more broadcasting. Mm -hmm. You know, our social media culture, and, and I love social media, we all use it. It's not Absolutely. a bad thing. Right. It's part of the language that we speak today, but so much of it is about presentation. Yeah. It's about broadcasting to others. Mm. That after a while, in subtle ways, it begins to change the way that we interact with others, that we're more concerned, we care more about, maybe we're more obsessed by looking a particular way yeah. than actually embodying it in our own lives. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, we just had a missions conference yep. where we inspire students to go out and change the world a little yeah. bit. And I think we have good intentions and we want to help other people. Yep. But what do we need to be aware of as yeah. we want to go and share the gospel and live missionally yeah. in our world? Well, that's a, I mean, I've heard wonderful things about the Biola Missions Conference, yeah. so let me begin there. Absolutely. I think it's great. I am here because of a crazy, crazy missionary about 100 plus years ago. That's mm. why I'm here. I don't know who that person is, mm. but someone was so captivated by the gospel mm. that they got onto a boat from some land many, many, many years ago, yeah. and they sailed across the world to Korea. Now, you and I probably know this, others might not, but back then, 
people actually had caskets made mm -hmm. in the dimensions of their physical body size because they weren't quite sure how they would get back, if at all. Mm -hmm. The reality of doing cross-cultural missions back then radically different than it is today. Mm -hmm. So I just want to first acknowledge I'm here because of the faith of someone who was so gripped by the gospel. Yeah. Now, having said that, I think we have to really, really be mindful about humility. We have to be mindful about sensitivity because as much as we should elevate the work of missions and missionaries, yeah. we have to also acknowledge the work of truth-telling. Yeah. And in the work of truth-telling, there has been egregious acts done in the name of Jesus, including colonialism. Mm. So I think as we try to inspire people to do good work, let's be wise, let's be humble, let's be teachable yeah. uh, in those works. The other thing about missions is it's easy to think about the work that we have to do over there and neglect the work that we need to do in our own neighborhoods, in our own Jerusalems or Samarias, if you will. Right. So I think there's so many different aspects to it. The last thing that I'll say about missions Please, yeah. is that, yes, we have to do the work of sharing the gospel, but I think it makes no sense to me if we're talking about those things and yet we don't care about some of the injustices that we're a part of from a globalized perspective, meaning, yeah. uh, I ought to be mindful about the hands that went into the production of the clothing that I'm wearing right now. Mm. So if we don't care at all about the flourishing of all people, in addition to the soul work that needs to happen, for me, there's kind of a disconnect. Yeah. All of those things matter. Yeah, great. You know, obviously, we could hear your heart for justice here, and we could hear your, your heartbeat for wanting um, all, of, all people to flourish. Yep. What was a turning point for you, and how did that get birthed in you, and what, where, where did that come from in you? Well, if, I mean, it's not rocket science, for me at least. It's yeah. just reading scripture. Mm. It's reading scripture. Yeah. And again, I, I don't have a, uh, an answer that's going to provoke some kind of epiphany. I think it's reading the scripture, mm -hmm. and as you read both New and Old Testament, the Old Testament, there's over 200 references about God and how God perceives justice. So when I look at justice from the lens of scripture, I see it not as a peripheral thing, a tertiary thing. I realize that justice really is a part of who God is. It's God's character. Yeah. As opposed to, I think, in our modern culture, we tend to extract certain things and then make it an agenda. So I've heard many Christians criticize uh, me or others by saying, why? Justice is like an agenda. It's a political thing. It's, it's a leftist thing. Right. And while that might be the case on some perspective, right. for us as Christians, we ought to view justice as central to who God is. And then obviously, just in studying and following Jesus' life, I think he embodies it, and that's why it matters. Great. You know, in your book, you talk about this idea that in America, it breeds this upward mobility. Yeah. But as followers of Christ, we need to breed a downward mobility. Yeah. How can we do that a little bit more carefully? And what, what are some examples from your life? Yeah, the concept of downward mobility. Here's Jesus. He relinquishes the glory of heaven yeah. to come and descend and be one of us. He takes on flesh and bone. I think it's Eugene Peterson in his uh, translation of the scripture and the message it says in the Gospel of John that Jesus moved into the neighborhood. He incarnated flesh and bone. And so when people speak about downward mobility, they assume that folks are trying to encourage a life of poverty. And I'm not quite saying that at all. I think, okay. I think downward mobility is to resist the pressures that we have in our culture where we have to upgrade yeah everything in our lives. Our phones are sufficient. It's fine. Yeah. We don't need to upgrade it every single year. Our clothing, our possessions, and so there's this pressure that we need to constantly be in this upward mobility because it's the engine to capitalism. Mm. And so again, when you criticize capitalism, people get all weirded out and frantic. Right. And maybe it is the best system in a broken world, but I think we have to ask the question, why do we have to constantly be in this race to upgrade everything? 
And so for me, downward mobility is to embrace a life of contentment, mm. to, to claim and to proclaim that Jesus is enough in wow. a culture that says you don't have enough. Love that. Thank you. Contentment, Jesus is enough. Simplicity, yep. we have enough to live off of. Amen. All right. All right, Pastor Eugene, we're going to answer a few questions from our live student audience. Yep. Okay, here's our first question. Sometimes it seems like people who love evangelism and people who love social justice, and you mentioned sometimes uh, then accused of being leftist, are at odds with each other. How can these groups be reconciled? Yeah. It's a great question. Uh, this debate probably has been going on for some time, but yeah. especially in the last 40, 50 years. Mm. And I would just say we need both of these communities in the church. But I think to be reconciled means that both of these convictions are part of the whole gospel. Uh, at our church, I love this phrase, the whole gospel. We want to be a church about the whole gospel. And the whole gospel certainly we have to keep preaching the message that Jesus saves, that Jesus went and walked through Golgotha to the cross, but Jesus' walk through Samaria, where he really embodies reconciliation, particularly men, women, Jews, and Samaritans. Both of those journeys are absolutely important. Mm. The reason why we need both of these groups in the church is to lose one means that we have a diluted perspective of the gospel. And so as awkward or as difficult as it might be, we have to see one another as members of the body of Christ, yeah. and we need both of these convictions, both of these theological passions in the church. And I hope that as Christians, those that are watching this right now, that we're embodying this in our lives. Yeah. So it feels like a fight, but it's not necessarily supposed to be a fight between these groups. Right. It's just they're different factions in the whole body in some sense. Well, I mean, every, factions is a hard word, every maybe. family fights. I mean, that's just the reality. Every, every family, there's dysfunctions, there's tension. And so I think within the church as well, it exists. Yeah. But I think if we listen to one another and we're reading the scripture, and I think as we listen to one another, it's really important. It's easy to kind of vilify and demonize and accuse one another of being heretics and so forth. Right. But as we read the scripture, I think both of these really are very apparent. And so as a result, it concerns me when in the church, particularly young people, we abandon one for the sake of the other, and both are so essential. Great. Thank you for that. Here's another question. When you started One Day's Wages, did you feel a personal call from God, or was it more of a thing that seemed like generally following his word? Man, good questions. I got a text from God. No, <laughs> just kidding. Wouldn't that be convenient if we had a text message system with God. You know, uh, I mean, yes and no. Uh, mm. I did not hear an audible voice from God. Uh, it's rare. I, I don't know if there's been an instant where I've heard an audible voice from God. Mm. But I think in prayer, as reading scripture, living in community, choosing to submit myself in friendship and relationship with other people that I respect and honor, uh, there are just deep convictions, these deep impressions that I feel the Holy Spirit is giving to myself. And even with those, there have been few in between. But in starting One Day's Wages, yeah. I came back from an experience, and so with my wife and I, we chose to just choose to enter into a time of prayer and fasting. And during that time, we had this, like, very deep impression from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so when we began to share what we were both experiencing, it was very, very convicting that it was also very parallel as well. Right. And so as a result, one of the things that God was calling us to do, and I say this not to sound boastful, was to give up a year's wages. Mm. So we started one day's wages by giving up a year's wages, and it wasn't something we wanted to do. But we felt this deep conviction, and so we went through a long season of three years of saving and simplifying and selling off things that we didn't need mm -hmm. and started one day's wages. I want to bring your daughter up here and ask her questions about that, <laughs> about that one year. But let's, let's go to this question. I have a strong desire to submit my life to the pursuit of social justice issues, but often feel overwhelmed by the seemingly endless amount of different issues to care about. From human trafficking to racial reconciliation to food production integrity, 
I tend to always feel like I'm neglecting a need somewhere. How do you go about being aware of these issues and still finding a way to not be spread too thin? This person is able to text really quickly if this person <laughs> is texting, because that's the long, that's the book right there. Uh, this is a great question. This is so important. And I really hope that my answer can serve as some sort of encouragement to the person that asked this question and to others as well. It begins by asking this question. Mm. It begins by acknowledging that we have finitude in a world and culture that seems like it has an infinitude of issues and problems. Yeah. Yeah. So one, it begins with asking the right questions. How is this possible? How is this doable? Because we can't flourish, we can't help others if we ourselves aren't engaging in some sort of a sustainable culture of rhythm in our own lives. Yeah. I think the second thing is just to also acknowledge what are our limitations. The person who tries to do everything ultimately will do nothing well. Mm. And that's just the truth. So as we inform ourselves of a lot of issues, I think it's good in our culture where we have access to so much information to have a level of knowledge about many things. That's a good thing right. because we have access to that. Right. But then when it comes to digging in, digging in and investing our time, investing our passion, investing our resources, we have to think about, pray about, discern what are the handful of things that I do really care about that I'm choosing intentionally to go deeper into. Right. And as a result, I think it's very possible that through prayer and discernment, there might even be a couple more specific things that God is calling us to really devote our attention, our affection to. Right. And so that would be what I would encourage someone to do. Great, can I ask a question off of that? Absolutely. With one day's wages? Yes. How, what was it in you then that said, I want to fight against poverty versus all these other issues? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's a few reasons. One is, I think it's being more aware of my own personal story. Mm. So, Mike, I don't know your personal background, but my parents were born in what is now called North Korea. Mm -hmm. My great-grandfather was one of the first people to say yes to Jesus in this small village outside of a larger city called Pyongyang which now happens to be the capital of North Korea. Now, when my parents were living in or growing up, uh, there was only one Korea back then, but they were children of the war. Yeah. And so the stories that they tell me are incredulous. It's unbelievable. Mm. The poverty, some of the barriers that they face, and yet in the midst of this, it was Christians, it was yeah. Christian organizations. Yes, there were others, but I'm really gripped by that. I'm, I'm motivated and compelled by women and men, particularly of faith, that saw the whole gospel. Yeah. They came with the Bible, they came to preach the gospel, but they also, out of circumstances, were the first ones to start orphanages, built schools, mm -hmm. built colleges and institutions. Right. And so I love the fact that as Christians, I wanna preach the message that Jesus saves, but I also care about the physical environments in which people live as well. In our world today, 2017, in a world of so much excess, mm. we live in a world today where approximately 663 million people don't have access to clean water. Mm. I mean, you and I have bottled waters, we're drinking it right now in our world today, that's the reality. Right. Approximately 40 million people are in some form of economic or sexual slavery. And the list goes on and on. And so I know I can't change the entire world. That's just the truth. Right. For me to say that would be ridiculous, arrogant. It's a marketing scheme. Mm -hmm. But I know that I can influence, impact the life of someone. And so that's really part of the story of One Day's Wages is we wanted to do something. Great. Thank you. Here's another question. Maybe we're the mountain God wants to move. That's your quote. Mm -hmm. Can you explain more of what this has meant in your own life? That would be too personal and too painful, <laughs> so let's go on to the next question. No. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope that that resonates with folks here. I think for us, it's always easier to project outward. Yeah. Uh, it's always easier to look at the plank in other people's eyes yeah. than that which exists in our own eye. It's easier to call out the injustice in the lives of others 
than to consider the complicity in my own life. It's easier to call out the privilege in the life of others than to notate the privilege in my life. Mm. And so when we're talking about the mountain that God wants to move, it's that same idea that there's stuff out there or there's things that God, that we think God wants to do in our larger world. And it's true, there's yeah. privilege in other people's lives, there's injustice in other people's lives. It's all true, but I think if we're doing it at the expense of ignoring some of the work that God might be wanting to do in our lives. When you look at the scriptures, again, God uses women and men for profound things, but almost every single time, God needs to do a work in their life. Yeah. Moses, Rahab, Elijah, Mary, and the list goes on. Mm. And so again, because Christian discipleship, for some reason or another, because there's such an emphasis around justice work, social justice work, which is great, but we can't do that without also acknowledging uh, the transformation, the repentance that needs to happen in our own life. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Here's a question from Samantha. Selfish question. Do you think Star Wars is better than Star Trek? It's a ridiculous question. And so why? <laughs> it's a ridiculous question. That person needs to repent. Samantha K at hashtag SGK47. Uh, I love, I love sci-fi personally, yeah. so I love and I watch both of these series and films, but Star Wars is better because the force is with <laughs> Star Wars. That's why your son is Jedi and not Spock, right? That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Here we go. Uh, here's another question. Uh, what have been some of the struggles you have experienced in ministry, particularly, particularly in a city like Seattle? How can we be praying for your church? Man, this is, this is a good question. It's a personal question, and it's an emotional question because mm. ministry is just hard, mm. whether it's here in Biola, whether it's in Orange County in Seattle. I, I really resonate with this question because I think what this person is saying is there's a context. Mm. There's a cultural nuance to wherever we may be. Yeah. And it's true. You know, I have friends that pastor in different places around the world, and it has both beautiful things also has really challenging things. Mm -hmm. So the city of Seattle has its unique challenges. It's one of the most beautiful cities in the world as far as I'm concerned. The topography, um, weather can be a challenge in many ways. Yeah. I think some of the thought process, it has both conservative thoughts, progressive thoughts, liberal thoughts. And as a result, sometimes it can be very uh, conducive or contradictory to the gospel. Uh, as an example, Seattle boasts one of the least church-going communities in all of the United States, mm. the Northwest and the Northeast. And so it's not just a non-church-going community. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a deep hostility or an adversarial nature mm. towards, I think, uh, people in Seattle. So that's one of the reasons why it's challenging. But yet, nevertheless, God is working and God is moving. And I love the wisdom that I've learned from other people. I have a friend that pastors in a city in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And he sent me a prayer request a couple months ago because 13 people that tried to kill him recently just got out of jail. Yeah. And I'm listening to his conversation and it's blowing me away because I don't have that story. And yet he is able to find the joy in doing ministry in that context. So mm. as for prayer, just pray for a unity in our church. Pray for favor as we build relationships with our neighborhood and community. Yeah, great. Here's another question from, I think, Kylie. How do you care for yourself emotionally and spiritually when you feel discouraged by the American church not preaching justice? So let me just say, this, these questions are blowing me away. These are such... Their questions are way better than mine, yeah, always. These, these questions are so good. <laughs> these questions are so good. My goodness. Uh, this is, wow. Um, the answer is yes. We need to emotionally and spiritually take care of ourselves especially as we're doing the work of justice. Uh, again, I don't want to sound too political. Uh, I am extremely discouraged by the landscape of what's going on right now in our country. Yeah. Um, I am disheartened 
Uh, there have been a few times where I have just been wrecked emotionally. Mm -hmm. I have been discouraged by the rhetoric that's been going on, particularly yeah. as we vilify and demonize those that might not fit into the standard of what an American person looks like. Yeah. And I'm talking in a variety of perspectives. I'm concerned by the Islamophobia that exists in our culture today, yeah. including in the church. Here's the reason why I'm encouraged. We just sang a song about the victory that is in Jesus. Yeah. And I say that not to easily placate the reality of injustice, but just we have to truly believe. Do we believe that Jesus rose again? Do we believe the tomb is indeed empty? Do we believe that Jesus in the end wins, that Jesus in the end conquers all things. I believe it. I may not necessarily see all of the evidence with the realities of the world around me. It reminds me of the Israelites and their journey through the desert for 40 years, yeah. needing to cross the Jordan River during flood season. At many, many points, they must have thought to themselves, this is crazy, this is ridiculous, this isn't going to happen, but they believed. And so my encouragement to people is this. Yeah. Don't think big, think long. Mm. Don't think big. Western culture, our idea of success is think big or think successful. I really think what it means to be successful is to think long, which means be faithful in the here and the now and think long for the marathon of justice. Great. So Pastor Eugene, one of the things we do as we close is to ask our guests, what are some of the biblical principles that help guide some of your thoughts today? And you could relate it to justice, you could relate it to um, leadership, you could relate it to pastoring, ministry, activism. What are some of the biblical principles that have guided and shaped some of your thoughts today? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. And it's a, it's a great question, and I wrestled with it when you gave me a primer about hey, we're going to ask you to close this with this question. And, you know, I think a couple things come to mind. And I know it's not very glamorous. Again, it's not fancy. Um, the scriptures matter. Mm. Uh, the Bible matters. And I think in our world today where we have access to speakers that come in from all different places, we have access to podcasts like this one that you're putting up, there's access to books. I'm so grateful for all the resources that we have. Mm. But I'm also tempted to lose myself in all of those things and at the expense of also heeding the wisdom of Scripture, to read the Scripture, to soak in the Scripture, to be guided by the Scripture. And as we read the Scripture, we see the profundity, the depth, the magnanimous nature of who Jesus is and how Jesus embodies and ushers in the kingdom of God. And so the world is so complex, diverse, nuanced, and I want to challenge myself and others, let's be about the kingdom of God yeah. that is more vast, more deep, more profound, more loving than we can possibly ever imagine. Great. Thank you. Guys, let's thank Pastor Eugene one more time. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.